Hi, everyone. Welcome to this paper night for the man who wanted to fly. It's wonderful to see faces. And uh, if you wouldn't mind keeping your audio muted, uh, I'd be delighted to kick us off. I'm Jason Smoller. I'm the Director of Development at Irish Rep. Thank you to our members who make everything happen and who are so loyal and show up to all of our events. It's nice to see your faces and your names. I'm joined tonight by our artistic director, Charlotte Moore, our producing director, Kieran O'Reilly, and the director of this terrific film that we've all just seen, Frank Schuldeis. And with no further ado, except to say, if you have questions for these people on the screen or anything to say, we'd love to hear from you. So please put it in the chat feature and we will call on you at a certain moment. And we'd love to see your face on the screen if you wanna ask the question. And now with no further ado, I will turn it over to Charlotte and Kieran and Frank, and we're delighted to have you all here. Oh, thank you, Jason. I was telling right. Kieran, it, it's wonderful. It, it's wonderful to uh, to hear a real Cavan accent. Kieran O'Reilly had one when he when he first came over here, but it's it kind of gone. But I, it was very nostalgic for me, and 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 rich, and 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 wonderful, and wonderful. Kieran. Well, I, I don't know whether I should speak in a Cavan accent so Frank will understand or, or whether I should just uh, do my sort of Irish American accent. I want to say that we that uh, we go back with Frank a long, long way. We go back to the very beginnings of the Irish repertory theater. And I, I would like to, to, to share an anecdote just to, uh, to give a little context to the evening. When we first started the Irish Repertory Theatre in 1988, there was a young cub reporter yes, um, around New York at that time, <laughs> trying, trying desperately to get an interview with the new founders of the new Irish Repertory Theatre. And he used bribes and he, uh, you know, he, he used, you know, talk of, you know, that if we meet at a certain bar, the drinks would be had for free. Uh, none of which materialized. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we did a, an extensive interview that lasted uh, probably a lifetime, actually, but it actually lasted about maybe three hours when it was discovered that there was no tape in the tape recorder that was going on. So we had to begin all over again. And that's a bit like, you know, waiting for dough. It's been like that ever since we've been waiting, you know, to do this <laughs> interview for a very long time. <laughs> That was, a, that was a rehearsal. That was a rehearsal. It was a rehearsal, Frank. So, Frank, <laughs> listen, t t tell us, t would you mind just telling, telling us a little bit about yourself and, uh, and what you've been doing up to this moment? Um, that's a very, that's a very. Sure. I, I do remember that afternoon. It was McManus's bar. And um, yeah, I, I was absolutely enthralled by Kieran's great story. And so obviously forgot to turn on the uh, tape recorder or the batteries were gone or something. Because uh, I was just, I was bamboozled by uh, his tales of daring do. And uh, so anyway, then we had to go, had to go back and do it all again. Um, so I, I'd actually left, left New York in 19... Two um, and over the last while, um, more recent past, I'm more involved in um, current affairs documentaries. Uh, so it's kind of on the the heavier end of the street in a way, and that is just relevant to the the background of the film because um, myself and my partner in crime on this, Dave Perry, who shot it, um, we had worked on a couple of. Uh, projects, programs that were current affairs that were more related to uh, things go uh, wrong or, you know, the, the, the uh, well, current affairs is uh, what that brings and uh, investigative work. And um, we wanted to do something as a project of our own uh, and something that would be very different to the, the sort of work uh, that we, we do every day. And we were looking for a story, uh, something that we didn't know whether it'd be something that would start as a, maybe a short film, something that would just lend itself to some, maybe something that we could do at our own pace. Um, and uh, we looked, kicked around a few ideas and nothing really had presented itself. Um, and Dave 
uh, is originally from Newcastle in England. And he and his wife and the kids, they live outside Baileyborough. Dave is actually into flying and he has um, a, a, a very flimsy uh, a craft called a paramotor, which he describes as a hairdryer attached to a handkerchief. And um, <laughs> so he, he was out on his paramotor and he noticed this. Uh, so it was over the fields of Cavan, uh, just like what you watch there. And he noticed this white speck kind of on the ground underneath him and he didn't pay too much attention to it. Anyway, he arrived, got home in one piece and um, had only arrived and there was a, a knock at the door. And he opened the door and there was this uh, elderly man in a baseball cap and a bomber jacket. And uh, this was Bobby Coote. And Bobby, who Dave didn't know Bobby, and he, he wondered first, is this some, a farmer whose uh, cattle he had bothered or something when he was flying over? And Bobby looked at him and he just said, uh, was that you up there in the sky? And uh, Dave says, uh, yeah, uh, wondering where is this going to lead? And Bobby said, I'd like to do that. And literally, this was uh, where the film began. So we had this kind of curious thing of there was us looking for a film and a film found us. And um, this that was the beginning. So subsequently, Dave told me about this encounter, which I thought was charming. And uh, it was there was something worth looking into. But what actually swung it for me was when I heard that um, Bobby lived at home with his brother and there were two bachelor farmers who shared uh, the family house. Uh, but had separate front doors. And I thought, well, if we can get the other brother in, then we're really into something. We can explore a lot more than just the story of a man with a dream, which has its own charm and beauty. Uh, but uh, the other would give a kind of depth to it. And then it'd be no holes barred if the other brother, uh, who turned out to be Ernie, uh, was up for it. So, we went over, uh, we met them, we explained what we were doing. They were a little bemused, uh, wondering why would anybody want to bring a camera into our house? Uh, why would anybody be curious about what we do and how we live? <laughs> and, you know, because sure, nothing happens here. And, um, uh, and they were open to it. And uh, that was, it opened the gates. Uh, and they were very generous and it took a, a little time for them to get used to it because it was just the two of us, uh, Dave and myself, and that was probably a key thing because it, it wasn't as intrusive as it might have been. And really, it took it started from there. Um, so the scene where when Ernie is speaking in the sitting in the chair and Bobby comes in and he comes to the window, that was actually the first day of filming. Uh, the novelty of the camera was irresistible to Bobby that even though I said to him, we'll, we'll drop over to you in a while, he, d he just could not help himself. And so when he came in and he says, yes, I welcome, Bailey Borra, Kevin. And uh, that was all, like everything else in the film, it happened like that. It just happened. So uh, the film took five and a half years to make. Uh, we didn't know it was going to take that length of time. Uh, it was kind of to let it happen at its own pace. Um, but there were points where we had to kind of bring it to an end. Uh, I just should say also that for about three, three and a half years, it was myself and Dave. And then it was got to the point where it was to turn a project into a production. And I went to uh, Loose Horse Films or Loose Horse Television, who had never done a feature film before. And uh, I'd worked with them on a number of programs and I knew they were the right people for it and it was great. So they came aboard, but allowed us continue in the form that we we're in and let us sort of get on with the job. And with the film board came in and then we brought it to fruition. So five and a half years later, this was it. <laughs> Wow, but that's that, that 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 is certainly an introduction. You've actually just taken about all of my questions have all been answered in, been. in that in that very brief synopsis. <laughs> Charlotte, go for it. Frank, how did you get those aerial shots? 
Um, yeah, uh, Dave was the DOP um, that uh, we had miniature cameras on the, um, it was a mixture of uh, Dave using the drone and small cameras that we put on the plane, which uh, the quality of these, these cameras is just astonishing um, because they were small um, GoPros. Uh, and even since then, because, you know, we were kind of a year into it when we did the first uh, aerial shots of our own, not the ones where uh, Bobby was up in the plane. But um, Dave then subsequently got a, a more sophisticated drone. But it didn't matter because it was about the moment and it was all about the truth of the moment. Uh, so, um yeah, we were delighted with the the GoPro. The, the The only difficulty we had on the 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 flight at the end was the sound, um, and uh, where it was quite indistinct. And again, it at the the loss of kind of technical technical perfection, it was the sense of it and the excitement of it that came through. And really, it didn't didn't really matter that it, it was the the actually the air coming in because these this is. Um, it's a microlight. That that plane is a microlight, and it's as flimsy as it looks. It always struck me that it looked like a shopping trolley going up into the sky, and uh, you know, and you'd be there wondering, you know, what what? It's not what are we doing, but what, what is anyone? Why would anyone go up in a shopping trolley into the sky? <laughs> Well, it, that, it, it is, of course, when, you, when you're br bringing that up about the technical difficulties of the uh, of like the final flight, for instance, there's no take two to this. You know, if it, it's it's this is this is what it is. And that's what's that's what's true of the entire in the, the entire uh, movie is that it's 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 at that moment. Like, I, I don't what I, what I like to ask you, Frank, is. It's you say you were it was five and a half years of a project with mm -hmm. you. And it was five and a half years from the day you started filming until the final edit. Is that is that what it is? How how yeah. I mean you seem to capture like like no nothing I've ever quite ever seen before, where you've captured these extraordinary private moments. I mean, and, and very, very, I mean, and huge moments in their lives, you know. One where where things had just gone downhill in a big way, and uh, and he got a phone call. How did you just happen to be there? I mean, like at that very moment when he gets the phone call that says, you know, you're not going to fly, and and uh, and Schuldeis is in the kitchen at that moment with his camera running. How how did this happen? Um, well, uh, it's it was the two of us, myself and Dave. Um, it, it, the phone call we had to be we had to arrange for Jerry to make the call and for us to be in place because we didn't want to interrupt it, and it was a call that he had to make. So, um, in the sense that we had to let Jerry know we were ready, we didn't know exactly. We it, there was nothing prepared in that way. We said, okay, make you can make the call now. We're ready for it. When it, it's it's funny you pick that because there are moments and people do pick particular moments uh, in the film that it, it kind of kind of grab them or remind them of things. But when th when that uh, call came in, we were we let it roll. And um, it was one of those moments where both of us felt the same that we almost because we'd got to know the two lads and the, their friends as well, Sean and Mary and uh, and the others who who helped make this whole thing happen because they didn't just help Bobby make his dream happen. They helped us make the film, you know. Um, but when we were watching Bobby actually just cave in getting that news, we both, for a sec, we had to kind of remind ourselves, oh, we're making the film, because you'd, you'd feel like going over and giving him a hug or telling him, oh, it's okay, Bobby, you'll be all right. And you realise, no, we have to let it let the moment sit. And uh, and it, it was, it was quite... Uh, upsetting in a way to just to be there and to stay detached from it but I'm really glad we did but we did we did but it was it was I remember sitting and I said Jesus this is um he he's so crestfallen here you know but 
you had to actually hold back for it. Um, so I don't want to exaggerate that it, it, it was five years from beginning to end. It was. Uh, but for long periods of those five and a half years, very little happened. So we we were, you know, we had other jobs. We, we had jobs that we, we, where we make our living. So it was all the time in between. Um, and then we'd, we'd take time off. And the, the Christmas scene, which is one that really hits people, I think, when Ernie is on his own having Christmas dinner, that was Christmas Day. Um, and um, it was Dave went over for that as I was in Dublin. But we wanted to get the, the you know, on that day. And um, there was a lovely, a lot of really lovely things have come from this film. I think it, it maybe this is what it's like Seth was saying earlier, that uh, in the, particularly in this time, it, it's nearly refreshing to see something that's good and real and true. Uh, but when the film was on and the, the Clonus Film Festival in Monaghan, uh, a woman put up her hand and she said, uh, I don't have a question. I just want to say that next Christmas, Ernie can come over to my house. That's <laughs> such a charming story, Frank. Um, we've got quite a few questions in the chat and I'd love to bring in some folks to the conversation if I can. Mary yes. Gerster, would you like to ask your question? Hi, Mary. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I wondered what their reaction was to the film and how both of them are doing at this point. How are you, Mary? Um, yeah, uh, it, it, they're both doing really well. I was speaking to them during the week. COVID has been uh, disruptive, but uh, they just, uh, Bobby's not convinced that COVID is happening. But um, they're just they're just getting on with stuff. They're really good neighbors, uh, and um, you know, at different stages. Because since the film, Ernie isn't driving anymore. Um, he's slowed up a bit. Uh, Bobby is indestructible. Um, Bobby's after buying a new plane. Um, so uh, the sky is the limit uh, with that man. Uh, he, he's he's a he's a comedy show of his own. Uh, but <laughs> even in the restriction, these, these are two lads who, who will never be bored. They will never be bored. And COVID was just uh, something that, it you know, it's come and hopefully it's on its way. But, uh, you know, mm. they, they just get on with stuff. And um, just in your first, we, myself and Dave were very apprehensive, actually, to be honest about it, when we got to show them the film, because we never showed them a frame of it. So... If you can imagine if, um, you know, over that such a long period, five and a half years, during which, as Kieran says, that a lot of the very personal issues were discussed. And in that time that we figured that they'd have forgotten what they had spoken about, particularly about their brother and um, and other stuff, you know, where they were prepared to speak uh, quite openly, candidly. And then th th they wouldn't have had any idea of what way this was going to present it to, and it was really important to us that if if everybody loved the film and they hated it it would be for us a failure um yeah. but so before we showed it to anybody we show we were up in dave's kitchen and uh, we were apprehensive and that's the truth um but they came up and uh, so they sat down in front of the big tv that they've had and, and we ran it and um, we, myself and Dave were sitting behind them and looked at each other when it started and was like, oh, <laughs> hope it's okay. But then we just, from sitting behind them, we just saw, first of all, Ernie's head bobbing. Uh, and we knew this was a good sign. And then we heard Bobby laughing. And then we knew we were okay. You know? <laughs> and then w when they got to the end, uh, in that typical uh, Cavanese uh, that... Kieran knows so well. <laughs> uh, so they get to the end and they watch it, and then we say to well, lads, "Okay, um, be honest. Uh, what did you? What do you think?" Because I really wanted this to feel that them to feel that it represented them and the community. And um, in that typical way, Ernie looked. I said, "Ernie, you're you're the elder lemon here, so tell us and just be straight." And he says, 
Well, he says, it's good. <laughs> and that was it. And uh, But uh, that was all we needed, you know. And then uh, it was like, well, Bobby, uh, well, so Bobby, what do you think? And he says, hi, he says, I would have liked a bit more of the violin in it now. <laughs> so, uh, I said, there's plenty of it. He said, no, I don't think you showed as much now. You, you were down and, you know, we were over filming them playing in the pub. And he said, and you only showed a bit of it. I said, OK, well, if that's going to be the only uh, complaint, well, then we're doing all right. And the name of the film is The Man Who Could Fly, not The Man Who Could Make the Violin, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he was known around Bailey as the man who never flew. Uh, and, and like they used to slag him off at this because he was always talking about flying and he was the man who never flew. And he said, they called me the man who never flew. And he says, I want to fix that story. And uh, so anyway, he did in the end. So Frank, I have a, a quick follow up to that, that conversation about the violin footage. How much was left on the cutting room floor after five years? Five and a half, Jason, don't do a set of our half year. Um, it, it, uh, a lot, a lot. Uh, the, the pressure, uh, and it was kind of under, when, when the film board came in, they said, you, you know, they, they would feel you should keep it under 90 minutes because the original cut was uh, nearly two hours. And uh, so there were scenes in it that were like anyone making a film like that would feel it's really painful to lose some of this stuff. And it was. Um, so there were there were scenes that, uh, you know, you'd love to have included. But I think in the end, it was the optimum duration. Uh, but, but for some of the stuff and also some of their their recollections you know that originally we had spent a lot more time on when Bobby worked in in England um because it was that emigrant story and he worked like so many Irish uh, on um building the roads and uh, as he's saying himself I was a bit of a rogue you know and he can work that out yourself but uh, he was working on a gang uh, around Birmingham in the Midlands in England and uh, one day he'd, um, yeah, the, he did, he'd absconded from work and the, the foreman came looking for him and it, he said uh, he couldn't find me. Uh, and then so I, I had to make up a story that I was going to collect things or something. So when he got back, I said, well, where were you anyway? He says, uh, I was sunning myself, you know, sitting on the bank of the, of the construction site motorway. Uh, and it was just there, there was a there was a lot more, um, so uh, yeah, it, as they say, kill your babies. Um, but some of it was difficult to to let go. I can imagine. I'd like to bring in Anya Donovan if you would like to unmute and join the conversation. Anya, are you there? Yes. Yes, I'm there. Sorry for having trouble with the unmute button. Uh, wonderful film. Greg and I just really, really enjoyed it. So many heartbreaking. I think that the Christmas scene broke my heart. I was ready to cry on that. But I, um, I teach business ethics at Dartmouth College, and I was absolutely horrified at the person who sold him this plane. And I'm wondering, did you do any follow up? And why wasn't that included in the film? I mean, it was, it was just terrible. Uh, obviously, he should, never should have sold him that plane. Um, it should make it really clear that the plane was in perfect condition when he bought it. Um, by the way, Anya, delighted you enjoyed the film. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the plane was perfect. It sat for about a year and a half. And uh, with microlights, you can't let them sit. Because uh, even after a few months, you'd have to change the petrol in them, you, you know. So... Bobby started doing a bit of DIY, uh, which um, even though he'd be far more mechanical than I would, uh, the, out the outcome wasn't much different. Um, and uh, so when <laughs> when Jerry, the, the engineer, actually saw the plane, we knew the history of that plane because it turned out that uh, 
the previous the other engineer Willie McIver had actually inspected the plane just prior we didn't realize this at the time but just prior to Bobby buying it and the plane was perfect um so it being there for a long time Bobby insists that he didn't take it out for a run in the field as in run it around the field we're not we weren't there all the time so we'll take his word for it um but but it's just that the, the plane by the time uh, it was ready to go uh, had been uh, it wasn't in the same condition that it was when he got it well that's good to know that there weren't unethical people selling him faulty products i'm glad i'm glad to have the clarification yeah no uh, and uh, no it, because um, the fellow who sold him the plane um like Bobby wanted to get the plane and he had been looking at other planes and so he got help from the fellow who sold him the plane but he had he then began he was concerned about he felt or whether someone had said to him that this plane was particularly fast and um it, this was a bit like going about things the wrong way we didn't because this was literally following him as he did it. and and in a way he did it backwards is because most people would do the lessons and then get the plane Bobby bought the plane and then he started thinking about lessons and um so it, it it's not it's not the script book for how to go about getting yourself into the sky uh but I anyone well, who gets the micronite yeah. you can't leave it sit uh and by the time he actually got brought up to Newton Ards where they reclaimed the plane pretty much and they had to do an awful lot of work on it. Um, it was nearly two and a half years uh, between when he bought it and uh, when it was ready to be airborne. But it needed a lot of work. May, and in, quite a bit of that work was to undo the work that Bobby had done on it. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Anya. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, a question from my colleague, Lisa Fain. Uh -huh. Hi Frank. I was just you answered it you answered it a little bit when you said you were just kind of letting the movie be what it was going to be. But over those five years, was there a time that you thought, oh, we're making a movie about somebody who never achieves their dream? Like, and would you have made that movie? Or did you wait till <laughs> you, you got this outcome and said, okay, this is the movie? Uh, that we it have. was a it, yeah, how are you, Lisa? Uh, it, it was a real difficulty uh, because we didn't know where it was going to go. We didn't expect to be on it for so long. Also, it was like, how do we bring this to a close? Um, and we didn't... Uh, Bobby had an idea of actually, he says, I'll tell you how you can finish it, which was really helpful, actually. Not really. Uh, he said, uh, why don't we get Jerry Snodden to fly the plane and then landed in the field and then Jerry can jump out of the plane and I'll jump into the cockpit and then we I'll drive the plane up to the front in front of the camera and nobody will know that everyone will think that I, I flew it and uh, what, what about that uh, and so I said thanks a million Bobby that's a great suggestion um, so in looking at it it was like how do we keep this real is that this is something we're not saying that uh, someone who hasn't done lessons, enough lessons, is ready to fly a microlight or, or to fly a plane or land a plane. So it, 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 it was with Jerry's help that it, it gave us a possibility of how Bobby could achieve even part of the dream and that at one stage he was in charge and that he could bring it to where he wanted to go. It, it, because we call it the big day. The big day was the last, like the flying day. And this was the last bit of the film. And that got postponed three times because of um, because of rain in Cavan and because of wind in Belfast. And um, it, it, and this was a sort of small budget film. And even on the last day when it finally happened, uh, it was touch and go whether we could do it. And if we hadn't have got, if it hadn't have been possible to land the plane that day, um, we would have lot, it would have been three months at least before we would have been able to try it again. 
and it would have created an awful lot of difficulty for us. Uh, would have put everything back a year at least. And so at various stages, I was thinking that just say, but it he doesn't get into the air. Like, what does that leave us with? And in one way, I, I thought, well, the pursuit of a dream is its own romance. And you know, we don't have to succeed in our dreams for it to be a great story. But it'd be a different film, you know? And if that's what happened, that's what, what would have happened. But it would have, it would have left, it, it would have been a, a difficult, more difficult film to complete. Um, so we were really fortunate that it, it panned out the way it did. Because in all the time in, in trying to bring it to a close, that was a real concern. And I was looking at how else could we um, bring it to a close if it does, it would feel like a defeat um, if he hadn't been able to, you know, get that moment. Uh, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, Lisa, but it, we were we didn't want to be prescriptive about it, that this is the way it has to end because we were following it. Uh, and thankfully, um, I, I, I would have had a, a difficulty actually getting the same feeling from the film if he hadn't achieved in the way he did achieve. Yeah. Thank good. you so much. Um, I'd like to bring in my colleague, Seth, for one last question. Seth, are you there? Hi, sorry. Um, I, I just love, I love that he did everything backwards. I love that in, that in order to fly a plane, you have to create land and, and create, it's almost as if he had to create a space within his community and then the hangar and then the plane and then learn to fly. And it doesn't make any, and it's also sort of like a hero doesn't always pick the best ways towards achieving their goal. They have to make mistakes. And I can see why he wanted more violin because like that's his getting himself up off of the map. You know what I mean? It's, it's I can see that totally. But I also wanted to, this, this beautiful, I mean, you're talking about having to kill your darlings, but this fishing moment that you gave lots of space for Ernie. And mm. I just thought it was very touching, this kind of platonic brotherly love of Ernie and the late Patty and a sort of a longing for days gone by. Can you talk about that montage of Ernie fishing and the video memory and why you chose to include it? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks Seth. Um, I, I I, I actually feel that was uh, for me a really important um, part of it uh, because um, in when we'd seen it and say people from the film board or you know when you're under this pressure to make up time, um, it was put to me a couple of times that maybe that's a scene that could go and uh, for me it not it could not go actually because. Uh, what it said to me about it was that because the focus was very much on Bobby's story, but an awful lot of people pick up on Ernie. And even though he's not in it for, you know, maybe he's there for about a third, a quarter of the screen time, that when he goes to the lake, it's almost like his whole, his friends and everything. It's like the ghosts of the past. But um, when he said, and it was, again, it was just happened in the moment that I didn't know when he was talking about his friend, that his friend was dead. And when I said to him, uh, so where is he now? And it just like that, when he comes back, he says he's in heaven. And it was just like, well, yeah, that um, it, it, there was, it was just a sense of place, time, and that we, at the, the very outset, myself and Dave, when we were talking about it, that my ambition with this was that we would enter their world for the hour and a half or whatever it was going to be at their pace and we'd step into the coots house and for the for the duration of the, of the film that's where we're going we park turn off your mobile phone and let's go there and um let's see you know enter their world yeah. and that and that and so the lake um you know, I think it is really important that we learned a lot from them, from both the brothers, because, like I say, they are so self, uh, they are never bored. If you go up there, they're always doing something. So um, 
it, it, it kind of taught us a lot. And incidentally, the, the, with the violin, and it was just a nice kind of circularity about it, but we incorporated the violin in the theme, uh, with the, which was composed by Giles uh, Packham, who's a, a Dublin composer. But he used the violin on the theme at the end so that the violin that Bobby made comes in as part of the music at the end. And that gave it a kind of, gave us that full, kind of full circle um, where Bobby was contributing to the soundtrack of his, uh, of his life, <laughs> in a way. I feel like it helped that Ernie Lake scene also, I mean, Ernie spent so much of his time saying no to things, saying, you know, he shouldn't do this, he shouldn't pursue this. And it allows us to kind of invest in him a little more deeply like he's not just a naysayer he's a character with memories and, and yeah i i had a I had a, a thought myself uh, that even though they're very different and uh, bobby is obviously very active very proactive and uh, early less so but as different as they are um the way it made sense to me was that um you have bobby in a plane going up into the sky to find the world and meet the world Ernie without stepping out of the house through the CB radio was actually bringing the world outside world into the house down the chimney uh, you know by connecting with the world without actually moving uh, and so they had their own way of doing things and um, in a way that was the kind of yin and yang of of the the way that the dynamic in the house and I they um I don't know if they realize how much they depend on each other because they're very independent people. Uh, and it is a thought, you know, it's just it's just a thought and it's not to be modern about it, but it's just that um, they have, they live beside each other, they drop into each other's houses, they don't eat together, they don't have meals or stuff like that, uh, it, it, but they know the other is there. And... Um, that's enough for them. Um, and it, it'll be a massive change when that changes. It'll be a change for whoever is there. Um, and uh, I think it, it'd be tough. But it's what it was a, one of the th really moving things was, Frank, that, that when he finally did land in that field of dreams, that uh, like the first one out the gate to congratulate him seemed to be Ernie. You know, after all the naysaying, after all of that, he was the one there with the hand. It was, uh, yeah, it, it, it was because they're not the most tactile people. And so um, Ernie extending the hand was uh, uh, what might in other places be the equivalent of a bear hug, that this was for him to be there. And it did cross my mind at the time of, you know, putting it to him, you know, you said this had never happened. But it it seemed uh, it it seemed inappropriate. I didn't bring it up because why why you know he was there. He went with it, and it, there was a joy uh, about it. And it was it was actually lovely to see them uh, together for that moment uh, because it, it became it became both of them. So um, and I think it really mattered to Bobby as well. This is what I mean that this interrelationship that they have that it really mattered to Bobby that Ernie was there. So when he it was almost when he was looking around, he'd nearly seek him out himself. He says, "There's my brother there." That, that's yeah. the. It's a, it yeah. was exactly that, wasn't it? That he was he he really the most important person on that field to greet him was going to be his brother. And, uh, and it, it, yeah, it, it meant it just meant a meant meant a lot, meant a lot to um, uh, to both of them, and it became a shared a shared experience. Uh, it was Bobby's achievement, but it became something they could both kind of hang on to. So, I, I, and actually, just was uh, was it Lisa or um, sorry, somebody else was uh, asking about how they are now. When we finished the film, uh, we, you know, so, and the, the lads came out and we went, they came to a couple of festivals and uh, they became very partial to champagne and ice cream, actually. Um, and the, it, and suddenly it dawned on them that uh, we weren't going to be up there uh, filming. Uh, 
even if it was periodically, you know. And uh, they were a bit, you know, oh, does that mean you're not going to be calling in anymore? And it didn't because David lives nearer them. But we'd stay in touch, and um, and it is important that we do. But there was an absolutely fantastic moment uh, in Baileyborough. Uh, there was a screening in the courthouse, which was renovated, and so the film was shown. And I was well, I was I went up to see it, and the the town were uh, everyone in the town had already seen it a couple of times, and Bobby was presented with a, a model airplane. He was delighted with himself. And uh, I said, we go for, we, should we go for a, a drink? Uh, up the, so it was just myself and Bobby walking up the main street in Baileyborough. And I just, so Bobby was looking ahead and I was walking and saw these two kids standing on the path and they saw Bobby coming and one of them says to the other, and Bobby didn't hear it. <laughs> the, the kid says to the other, he says, he says, there he is. There's the man who wanted to fly. And you might as well have said, there's Superman. <laughs> and I was going to say it to Bobby and I didn't because it was such a beautiful moment because the kids were agog at Bobby walking past and uh, they just looked at him and I just thought what a precious moment that was was he, was he wearing a cloak at the time or anything was he, was <laughs> well he... when he came out of the phone box yeah it's, it's such by, a by the way a big, big, big... Before we before we go away, I, I want to, you know one of the other things that uh, that uh, Mr. Scholdice does is is he writes a book, and this is here. This so this is a, a shameless plug for your book, Frank. Uh, this is about uh, Frank's grandfather who fought in the 1916 Rising in Ireland, and uh, there's a whole long story behind this, but I'm sure you're going to have to Google it to find out. But uh, Frank found uh, like later later in life. That his uh, that his grandfather was one of the heroes of the 1960 rise in Ireland, and uh, so that's the book. So that's the shameless plug. Frank just shameless didn't know plug. I was going to say that. <laughs> Thanks, Kira. Shameless plug. My favorite type of plug. Um, yeah, Grandpa the sniper. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was a different different thing, very different uh, story, but fascinating in its in its own way. But uh, so somebody asked me, and uh, um, like the difference between um, doing the investigative work, investigative journalism, current affairs stuff, um, and this, and what was the difference? And it, it actually came to me very clearly that often when you're working in um, investigative work, it's it's very um, there's a lot of satisfaction if you. You, you get the story and it, more or less that this is something uh, whether you're shining a light on something that's wrong or a, a, an inequality or an unfairness or corruption or whatever. And it, there is a satisfaction about that, about getting it right and exposing that. But the difference with the man who wanted to fly was that it actually brought for Dave and myself, it brought us joy. And that was the difference. Um, the other work is very satisfying in its way. This was uh, something that we'd actually feel a, a kind of pride and joy about it. Uh, and that the two boys, uh, as we call them, um, also feel proud of it. They're proud of it and proud of what they achieved and contributed to it. And there's a kind of a twin track because like I was saying that where Bobby wants to get to fly, but for myself, it's like a twin track in a way, because for myself and Dave, if that was Bobby's ambition, our ambition was to make a documentary. And so when Bobby foundered, so did we, because like, it's like Lisa was asking, where was it going to go? If he, if he failed, where would we go? And so um, what picked it up each time was the, the, the community there. And I think this is something that people really tap into. The, the, there was a goodness there that people helped out, no money, uh, no, nothing. It was because they wanted to, and they saw someone. And the the, the lads in Belfast, Jerry and Willie um, and Joe, uh, that they saw somebody who wanted to achieve something, and they wanted to help them. And it was as simple as that. And the community as well in the help when we needed help in making the film, people stepped in because they wanted us to succeed as well. And uh, 
it, what goes around comes around. Uh, and we, we don't get that. We don't get that really too easily. You don't get that, Frank. And I, and I, I want to say that, uh, you know, for, what, what Frank is, he's, a, 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 he's an inc incredible investigative journalist in Ireland and he's, he's highly respected and feared. And the people that he's feared by is generally like pedophiles and corrupt landlords and drug dealers and dangerous criminals that he unearths. Uh, and all the time in 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 Ireland, he's he's out there, you know, fighting for justice and and uh, and and exposing those that do wrong. This is what Frank does in in real life. So to actually, it must have been a kind of a little bit of a vacation to go down to the to the beautiful county of Cavan, uh, amongst the lakes. And <laughs> Here the we go. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> what cavern was that, Kira? Or what, what county? <laughs> the beautiful cavern, Frank. Oh, yeah. yeah. So in case you don't know, Kieran is from cavern. <laughs> <laughs> he was cavern oh, man right, of yeah. the year. So, that's Frank, right, yeah. <laughs> Frank, this is an incredible universal story. It is so wonderful to be able to share it with the Irish rap family. We do have two more screenings tomorrow, and I think they are well sold, and we're excited to share it with more people. Um, By the way, Mary Gerster wanted to know where pe people can see this and or or buy it or or get it. Uh, it's on. Uh, it's online. Uh, we'd love to have. You know, this often people. Well, DVDs are becoming obsolete, which is hard to believe, but. Uh, but it's on uh, whether it's Amazon or Amazon Prime or it's or, or also um, uh, Kieran, did I send over the, the, the there's a number of uh, sites that you can you can rent us on uh, the, the, um, the, the there's one in Ireland uh, from the the Irish Film Centre. Um, if you Google it, you, you, you'll see where it is. Just Google the, the man who wanted to fly. And it's it's on various platforms. Uh, it's not ideal, I know. And by the way, I'm really appreciative to the rep for putting this on because we'd love to have put the, it. This is a fantastic experience in the cinema. It really is. Uh, when it, we premiered it in Galway, the screen was, it was the biggest screen they had in at the um, cinema in Galway. And it was the first time we, myself and Dave were sitting at the back and the place was jammed. And we were thinking, look at the size of the screen. And for, but from the first second uh, and the way Dave had shot it and the way Emer O'Cleary had cut it, it belonged there. It belonged, the, the bigger the screen, the more it was able to sit on that. And it was fantastic to see it. But Given the circumstances and everything, I, myself and Dave are really appreciative to the rep and for the efforts that have gone into getting it out and that people have shown the interest. It, it really does mean a lot. That's fantastic. Well, I, I think we all so appreciate it. Um, I want to say a thank you to our members for joining tonight again. Uh, our members are invited to a coffee with an actor with Ali Ewalt on Thursday this week. And if you don't have information, please contact me or Seth. And then I want to put a plug for our gala, The Indomitable Irishry, on June 14th. And you'll see more information about that in the coming weeks. And Charlotte and Kieran, I'll leave it to you to close. <laughs> Well, I'll let Kieran close, but it, it's been wonderful, wonderful to see you again, Frank. And congratulations for uh, many, many a uh, happy tear as I watched that. And it was made better by knowing that you did it, missing you all the time. Thanks, Thank you, Charlotte. I'll, I'll, I'll just say good night because I think Frank, you know, if Frank, Frank is in Dublin right now, so it's uh, it's one thirty in, in the morning, which is long past Frank's uh, bedtime. Two twenty three, actually. <laughs> oh, actually, two twenty three. I can't count. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, this the, the, this was uh, I, I first saw this during the um, you know in, 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 during the summer when everything was isolated and, and like to see this, this film during that time, it, uh, you know, it, it, it felt, um, you know, it, it actually, it was a feel good film, you know, it, uh, it, 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 it made, it made you think that things 
come out of isolation that are grand and big and beautiful. And, uh, and you, you captured it. And, and it's the mo one of the most honest things that I think that I've ever seen. That didn't feel like there was a moment in there. From, that was from one Kevin boy to another. Mm -hmm. well, listen, thanks a million. It's, it's, it's an honor to be there. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for your interest. It, it, it's great. And I'll pass it on. Uh, I told Bobby, by the way, because uh, he had spent a, a couple of months in New York back in the uh, early 80s, actually, and uh, he was scratching his head, says, oh, it's in New York. All right. And he was chuffed, chuffed at the at the notion. So um, I'll it's pass on your regards. All over the country as well. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good everybody. night to everybody.